So I wonder how, how should we think about uh, heterogeneity in effort within types? If you take a, a standard sort of rational choice setup, then you have two sources of heterogeneity. One is the set of constraints and the other is, the, is preferences. So presumably the uh, differences in constraints, that is circumstances, right? Now if preferences are given, isn't that also circumstances? But then there's no heterogeneity left. So that, maybe that's the wrong model of choice then that I have in mind. So my question is basically where, where does this heterogeneity come from? Um, what is your opinion on migration? Um, given that Rawls was not very fond of migrants and rather nationalists, and there are reason for, reasons for that because the whole minimax uh, there is problematic in, in the case that you suddenly change the society in terms of adding new persons which are maybe on the lower bound. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Shall I start with those? Okay, yeah. Okay, so the, those are two great questions. On the first one, um, it, it goes back to some of the philosophical differences. So th these guys that came up with this have this control view, what I call the, the control view of inequality of opportunity, meaning to say they are holding you responsible for your preferences. So yeah, the heterogeneity of effort does not come from, the, the one that comes from differences in constraints is the one between types. So it's my example of the, um, the kids from the banlieue and the kids from the, the, the parents of the Ecole Polytechnique, right? So they, they spend very different amounts of hours doing their homework, but that's because of constraints. Now within a type, then any difference that's due to preference, I mean, so I'm lazier than you, then I, ha I have to be held accountable for that in this view. But it is a, a, a contentious view. I mean, Dworkin, that I also cited, feels that some preferences should be treated as uh, differently. So these become kind of philosophical debates that are inevitable in something that's normative, I, I, I suppose, right? The, the version that I presented is one in which preferences, you are held accountable for them beyond the type mean preferences. Uh, on migration, I mean, I think um, you're referring in part to the sort of uh, distinction between the roles in, in um, a theory of justice, which is very inclusive and maxim him in, and, and roles in a law of the peoples, which says, well, if people are from another country, then that's a different thing. There's no social contract across nations, and there's no sense other than compassion in which we here in Poland should feel responsible for people in Mali, for example. Um, and so that depends, I guess, whether you take a national, a, nas a nation specific, an intranational view of inequality of opportunity or a multinational view of inequality of opportunity. Uh, my colleague, uh, former colleague at the World Bank, Branko Milanovic, uh, when he sort of saw this kind of stuff, thought, well, you know, if we look at the inequality between people in the world, most of it is actually between nations. I mean, the, the, the nation you were born to, if you're thinking internationally, is part of your type, right? And it's a huge part of your type. The inequality between countries is so large that if we were to take that view, then um, quite a lot of the, inequ the inequality of opportunity in the world would be much higher than it is in any particular country. And quite a lot of that would be the country that you were born into. And if you were to take that view as an internationalist, then I guess you would be very welcoming of migration um, as an as a, as a equalization mechanism. Um, but again, that's a philosophical view, so I don't think there's a right answer or a wrong answer, right? It's a, a matter of people's pre preferences and beliefs. More comments here? Uh, I have to ask a question which has to be asked on this conference. Uh, so, what about skill bias technological change? It changes the reward for the effort, or it, it changes, uh, I, I'm not sure now because it's a, it was just came, came to my mind, if it changes the, uh, the, uh, the reward to effort or to the circumstances. In, a, uh, other, in other way to ask this question is, uh, does this technological bias, technological, uh, skill based technological change, does it change the uh, equality of opportunity or not? 
Claude? I have two, actually, if I may. The first one is, uh, let's say that we analyze the inequality of, of outcomes among 50-year-olds. What is actually the circumstances there? Because let's say, in general, my education choice can be my effort. But when I'm, let's say, when I'm going to be 50, that's my circumstance. Because I'm not going to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not able to influence the choices that I made back in the days. And my, it, it could be the best choices provided the information I had in the past. But then they form my circumstance in the future. So is it possible to, to analyze, let's say, in this kind of like intergenerational or, or is there a risk of like inconsistency over time on how we interpret the um, effort and opportunity uh, or circumstance, rather, sorry. And the other is, what is your favorite outcome variable for analyzing that? Because, if, like you mentioned, Branko Milanovic, so then the, I think that the, the narrative on the global inequality is rather on in income, whereas if you read the papers on like extreme poverty, that's rather on consumption. So f from that point of view, is there any preference to use income or consumption? <coughs> Uh, Janek, to you. Mm -hmm. Hi. So the question, um, which probably again drives back to what you define as circumstance and effort. So I can imagine some circumstances that uh, are exogenous to me, but they depend on the effort of someone else. So probably the most uh, typical one would be the bequest and you know my parents, but also it could apply to teachers, for example, right? So. Um, as a teacher, I might have ince additional incentive to to make sure that my students are doing well, and by uh, equ equalizing at the end, you take this uh, effort of the others away. Shall I try those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are great, great questions, and um, they make me think. I'm I'm always a bit scared about talking about the philosophical side of this with economists, but actually. Um, you, you guys are really into the philosophical aspects of this, which is, which is interesting. Now, let me start with the uh, skill bias technical change uh, thing. So this is a great question, because it, it's like a real economic, I mean, there's an economic change. How does it affect that? Um, how does it affect that map, right? that stuff. Um, and I, I think, I mean, suppose that all it does is it makes the return, the, I mean, I know skill bias technical change can come in many ways, observed and unobserved skill. Suppose what it does is it just makes the return to observed years of schooling higher. Okay? So it's a simple, you know, more, more returns to education. Then it would do two things. If there are differences in education within a type, then it would make those things steeper and make make the, the inequality, the, the reward inequality higher, right? But to the extent that your parental background is affecting how much education you get, it's also spreading the, the, the types. So these types over here, these guys over here, which are the children of the Ecole Polytechnique types, they get more schooling than these guys, okay? So the rewards to schooling, I mean, the skill bias technical change, change when it comes, and it means that if you can use computers, your salary goes up, it doesn't distinguish between this difference and that difference, right? So both would go up, presumably, in that kind of case, and it would be a matter of designing public finance systems and taxes and, and transfers and, and so on that would, that would um, uh, deal with that. So, of course, uh, you know, it's the question I got yesterday at the little interviews. I mean, what, what kinds of policies does one use? And, of course, you know, I mentioned briefly uh, Hackman's pre-distribution approach of investing in children, early childhood development, promoting access to education. But there's also taxes and transfers that may be different, and how you would make those taxes and transfers would be an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't want to be more specific than that, but I think the answer to your question is it may very potentially very well affect both, not just the, the, the effort. Uh, your first question, Piotr, um, circumstances when you were 50. I mean, this is one of the deeply philosophical ones. The way I think of it is almost like a question on statutes of limitation. You know, when you commit a crime, right, you murder somebody in the United States, at least. I think if it's like, if you get caught, I don't know how long it is, but 30 years later or something, is there any lawyers in the room? You can no longer be prosecuted, 
you know, certain crimes expire, right? Uh, they, you can no longer be prosecuted after a certain amount of time. What's the rationale for that? The legal rationale for that seems to be that you are actually a different person. You killed someone when you were 20. When you're 50, I mean, you may still be a bastard in some ways, but maybe not exactly in the same ways, and you'd no longer be sued for that thing. Well, it, you're asking about that with respect to some of your previous choices. When do your previous choices become circumstances? Uh, this, I, I think, is a great philosophical question. I'm not sure. In our applications of it empirically, we've typically not done that because we simply use things at birth. But to the extent that you have panel data, which you guys in Europe do, um, you can start playing around with those things. And I think that would be quite innovative, actually, if you, if you did. If you said, at a certain age, suddenly your education becomes a circumstance rather than an effort. That would be quite interesting. Uh, which variables, income or consumption, you asked about, right? Um, again, it depends on what you're looking at. And, you know, I've done this with test scores in PISA, for example, which are completely non-monetary things, and they're interesting, too. But of income and consumption, I found, and I, let me not say favorite, but let me just say... I found that household per capita consumption is the one variable for which we find the highest lower bounds of inequality of opportunity. And the reason is that consumption typically smooths, right, over income, so there's less of a transitory component, which is typically unexplained and then becomes interpreted as effort in this case, all right? And the other thing is separate from earnings. It's much higher than earnings. And the reason it's much higher than earnings is that circumstances affect your consumption per capita in many more ways than just your labor market. Mm -hmm. It affects them through assortative matching, who you marry, your fertility decisions, and all sorts of other things. So potentially non-labor incomes, inheritances, all sorts of things. Uh, and the last question, circumstances is other people's efforts. That, that's a, another interesting philosophical question. Um, there are people, um, philosophers, Alan Nozick and more, uh, more on the right, who we'll say, look, uh, if you invest in your children, uh, you invest in your children with the idea that that investment should be appropriable by them. They are, should be able to appropriate the results of your investment in them. And therefore, they should be entitled to those rewards. That begins to move the treatment of equality of opportunity to lineages rather than individuals. And if you do that, you weaken the framework dramatically. I mean, it's, it's a view you can take. You can say, I only care about circumstances that are like race and gender, but not family background. You, you can certainly apply that. Most of the people that I have uh, found myself following in this literature do establish a separation and say, no, what your parents do, it's our efforts for them, but they are circumstances for you. But that does entail that you have a vision of society where the state is able, you know, I get asked often, look, you have children, you invest in your children, what society do you want to live in? And, and that's why I have my little phi belonging to capital phi there. I, I say, I like to live in a society where I am able to invest in my children, and the state doesn't, you know, it's not Sparta where they take my children away from me and all raise them in. And I would like my children to be able to choose who they marry and so on. But I would prefer to live in a state that's actually fighting very hard to tax me to promote, you know, good teachers for poor kids. Um, so, but it depends. Okay, any other last question? If no, then thank you, everyone, and thank you for, for the great uh, lecture and speech, and uh, yeah, you're invited to the coffee break.